Hey guys, so this is going to be part two of the GDND notes number three lecture. Um, we had left off with the 1936 election, so I'm going to go back to a couple images. So we're here on section six of notes number three. The election is right here on section five from before. So we had left off that in 1932, FDR got elected, um, and this electoral college map represented how many people voted for him. And as you can see, very little red for the Republican Party. It was a landslide victory for FDR. So four years later, 1936, after four years of New Deal agencies and acts and direct relief and all the stuff that he had promised he was going to do, people had to decide, were they happy with FDR or were they going to go another direction? And this is the Electoral College map that shows you what they decided. They decided that overwhelmingly, again, they were going with FDR even more. He had lost six states by four in the 1932 election, even though he won super easily. And now he only loses two, so it's even easier win, which showed that the American people were happy with FDR and they wanted him to continue being president. So we're moving on to section six, movies are a hit. Now, there are many industries that are going to struggle during the Great Depression. It was hard for industries to make money when people had no money. You can't go spend money you don't have because there were no jobs. But there was one industry that continued to be successful and make money, and that is the movie industry or the motion picture industry, basically Hollywood. And the reason is because the, hard, the, hard, the Great Depression was a really hard time for people. It was difficult for their lives, and people were sad and angry and sorry about everything. And going to the movies was an escape. It was a way for them to go pay a little bit of money. It was very cheap to go. And you're able to, for an hour and a half, go watch a movie and escape into another world, another world that doesn't have you not eating that day or that still living in a shanty town or barely surviving. And that's why movies in that time tended to concentrate on escapism, the idea of going somewhere else. Like movies like Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, Snow White. Like if you think of Snow White, I mean, I'm sorry, Wizard of Oz, she goes uh, to another world because it's, she's escaping from the world she lived in. And this is what a lot of movies like this, Alice in Wonderland was also made during this time, where you know she goes down the rabbit hole to another world. The idea is that you would go and escape, or go watch a funny movie and laugh for an hour and a half. Laughter is a huge part of even just surviving. And if that meant for an hour and a half, you could take just like a deep breath and then just come out and be a little bit more positive, then that was going to keep you going. So movies continued to be successful. The radio continued to be successful primarily because if you already had a radio, it was free. So there was, like we talked about before, lots and lots of shows. There were soap operas, children's shows, the news, sports, comedy shows, drama shows. Radio was very, very powerful, like we talked about in the 1920s. One example of how powerful it could be is Orson Welles' The War of the Worlds, where he basically started a show where it made it seem like it wasn't a show. He made it seem like they were playing live music from a hotel and people were just listening to the music on the radio. And then all of a sudden, breaking news, there have been um, a UFO spotted in New York City. And then back to the music. And so people would go back to the music and like, what the hell? Did we just hear that they're UFOs? And this is how he started the show. People thought they were listening to music, live music. And in reality, it was already the show. And people were so freaked out, they called the cops um, saying that the UFOs were aliens were invading. He, this is how powerful it got. But the cops had to go into the radio station where the show was being played and force them to, on the radio, tell people, this is just a show. So the radio continued to be entertainment because they needed some. Uh, the New Deal affects the art. So it was hard to get a job if you were a skilled worker. What about if your skill was uh, being a writer, being a musician, being a sculptor, being a painter? You needed to make money as well. So part of the WPA and that was one of your key terms, the Works Progress Administration, is it paid artists a certain amount of money so they could actually make works pro, uh, public arts. What that basically means is we are opening, we just made a new museum and we want a big mural. So we're going to hire you to go build, uh, to draw that big mural. And that's going to take you weeks to do. So that's weeks of work that you have now that you didn't have simply because the WPA through the Federal Arts Project is going to pay for it. So... It was difficult in, for people to find jobs in the arts, so the WPA is going to help them. Music, Woody Guthrie, very famous song, This Land is Your Land, This Land is My Land, from, the, from California to the New York Islands. I'm sure some of you sang that when you were a little kid. I'm sure you sang it better than I did just right now. But either way, this song was paid by the WPA, you know, the Federal Arts Project, to Woody Guthrie so he could write a song about how messed up society was during the Great Depression. 
And this land is uh, this land is your land is basically a song trying to tell everybody that it doesn't matter where in the U.S. you are, um, we're all in it together. They also had writers. One of the greatest American novels was written by the WPA money, which was The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. And this one dealt with um, the Dust Bowl and how society was destroyed by the Dust Bowl. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So Section 9, Environmental Changes. FDR was highly committed to basically working on conserving the environment. And one of the things that he noticed was that throughout the 1800s, when we have industrialization and made so much business, that we cut a lot of trees down, like a huge amount of trees down, but we didn't plant them again. So part of the CCC was to fight that. So they paid young unemployed workers, people who didn't have experience, they wouldn't be able to get a job because no experience and young, to plant trees and set up parks and you know preserve soil, all these jobs. Necessarily, we didn't need more trees at that moment or parks at that moment, but it, it provided a job. Now, a lot of the agencies that we've talked about are still around today, maybe not the exact name, but over the years, they've been com combined with other acts or other agencies and changed the name or be part of a bigger group. The CCC is one that is not around today. It is one agency that has basically disappeared. Um, the Dust Bowl, one of the most destructive natural disasters that lasted for years for Paris of Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, and unfortunately happened in the middle of an economic disaster, which is the Great Depression. So people are going to suffer tremendously. People are going to suffer because of um, storms like this that would hit them out of nowhere. It was fine. It got breezy. And all of a sudden, all this is in the air. Storms, scary storms that look like this, where you could um, have your hand a couple feet in front of your face and waving it, and you won't see it. And if you're caught outside in this without any protection, you could suffocate to death. Then when the winds would go down, the wind, the dirt would all come down. And look at this. This is supposed to be a car. Look how high the dirt is there. Look at here for vegetation. How are you going to grow agriculture if it's covered in dirt like that all the way? And this is how bad it could get. That's a barn, a big barn. And look how far high the dirt is all the way to the ceiling or to the roof. This is how bad it could get. So people suffered during the Dust Bowl tremendously. Um, why did it happen? One, a lot of people during World War I wanted to be farmers in this area, and the land was cheap, so they bought land to be farmers because during the war, whatever you grew, you sold. So when you got the land, you had to get all the grassland out. Grassland is just land that's covered in grass, but what the grass does with the roots is it protects the dirt and it keeps it down. So now people had to take all that grassland out in order to be able to plant their crops. Then you had to produce mechanization of land. Then you had to actually chop up the land so you could grow your crops. But then when, um, in, when World War I ends and people aren't selling their crops, a lot of these farms were lost to the banks and basically abandoned. But they didn't go back and plant the grass. They left it the way it was, chopped up dirt with no grass to protect it. Then the third reason is stop raining. So all that chopped up dirt got really dry. And then the worst one is the high winds came. What happens when you have chopped up dirt that's really dry? It goes up into the air, into these massive dust storms like this. So that's why it happened. Um, farmers couldn't do anything. People could not live in this society. How are you going to live with if this happens for hours and then this is the next day and then this is the two days later? Um, so people left. And that's the story of the Grapes of Wrath, the, the John Steinbeck book I mentioned earlier, where people left. The people who left often, often were given this term of okies term used to describe displaced farmers from the Midwest. A lot of them came here to California because when they saw the movies and in California, it looked like the, in Hollywood, everything was great. People actually thought that the reality was that California wasn't hit by the Great Depression. They thought that if they came here, everything was going to be fine like the movie showed. Obviously not. The Great Depression hit the whole country, but people came anyways. And it's going to lead to all kinds of other problems that we'll talk about in more detail. More agencies. The Works Progress Administration is going to be by far the biggest agency that's going to be created. We showed, I showed you this picture before in class that all this big circle represented all the people in need and that he was going to pass all kinds of acts and agencies as part of the New Deal to try to get as much help for as possible. So direct relief, as we talked about, giving them the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. They're the ones who are going to provide direct relief. Tons of it to people. The CCC, Young Workers, Federal Home Loan Bank Act, people who own their homes, Social Security Act, the elderly, Agricultural Adjustment Act, farmers, Federal Security Administration, more farmers, Farmer Security Administration, the Wagner Act, workers. Uh, this is also for workers. It's the, uh, which one is it? Let me go back so I can make it clear. I don't want to mess it up. 
It's the da, da, da. it's the Fair Labor Standards Act. More workers, and the idea was basically that um, that he was going to pass as many acts or agencies to help as many people as possible. But after he did do that, and he passed all these acts and agencies, he realized there's still a lot of people in help in need. And that's what I did by drawing this yellow part all around the axe. This is supposed to represent what the goal of the WPA was. If you were here and didn't get help from any of these agencies or were here and didn't get help from any of these agencies, he needed to create a big, huge one that would help everybody. And that's going to be the Works Progress Administration. This act was most responsible for creating jobs, more jobs in everything. Um, in, in especially construction, but teaching and arts, like as we mentioned before, um, garment making, all kinds of things. When they built roads, airports, public buildings, he put a lot of money to make sure that even unemployed artists, as I mentioned with the Federal Arts Project, got paid. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration, again, this was direct relief, and they passed this uh, to give even more help and more help. Social Security Act, as we talked about before, created pensions for the elderly who could not work anymore and therefore still needed to you know, eat they also created unemployment insurance. This is something that helps so many people today out where basically if you lose your job, you get a paycheck from the government to keep you going until you get another one. And they even provided aid for dependent children who were disabled, like people, like kids who were blind. Lots and lots of help from the Social Security Act. Now, here's the thing. If you're going to spend, 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 spend like FDR did, you need to have the money. We obviously didn't. And he told people, we don't have the money, but I got to help you now. The problem is that leads to deficit spending when a government spends more money than it has. That's a problem because that be becomes a problem that in the future, it's going to be like an explosion to our economy. FDR argued, how bad can it get in the future? As bad as it is now. Let's help people now. We'll worry about that later. Um, so deficit spending, like I said, was like a ticking time bomb. And it's something like this right here. So this is our economy, this is our society, and there it's lit, and it's going to go, and it's going to go, and that fire hits here, our economy and society is going to basically explode. So there was a lot of criticism of him that he's doing too much of this, and he doesn't have a plan to pay the money back. Now, eventually, it will be paid back, and we'll talk about that later. Um, the Supreme Court reacts. Well, the Supreme Court ruled that there was many of the acts that he had paid, that passed, like the National Historic Recovery Act, the Agriculture Adjustment Act that we talked about, the Warner Act that we talked about, they were simply unconstitutional. Not necessarily because they were bad acts or laws that were created, simply because the power that created those acts, they didn't have. Um, like the example of the Agricultural Adjustment Act, it was passed by Congress. Congress doesn't have the power to pass an act for con uh, agriculture. Only the states do. So if the st each individual state passed the Agricultural Adjustment Act, then it would be fine. But since the federal government passed it and they don't have the power to deal with agriculture, then that means unconstitutional. Same thing with the Wagner Act. Right? It needed to be a local matter to the state, not a federal government. So that meant the states needed to take care of it, not the federal government. So again, if every state passed the Wagner Act, it would be fine. But since the federal government did it, unconstitutional, 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 essentially, bye-bye. Well, FDR got hit three times there. And FDR, unfortunately, um, did not respond well. Because instead of saying basically, okay, well, our government is set up in a way where, you know, if the Supreme Court says that's it, that's it. You know, they get to rule that something is unconstitutional. His response was something called the par court packing bill. He tried to reorganize the court by adding six more judges. So the idea was that right now we have nine judges and he kept on losing five to four, five to four, five to four, and all three of those acts because there was nine judges. So his attitude is, let's add six judges. Now, the way the Constitution says, if you're going to add a Supreme Court judge, he nominates a judge. Congress passes um, the judge and makes them part of the Supreme Court. Well, what type of judges do you think FDR was going to nominate? Judges that are going to go with him or against him? Which meant if he nominated six judges and then Congress approved those six judges, which is what Congress did. Congress did everything that FDR told him to do. Very powerful president. That instead of losing five to four, he would always win now 10 to five because you add six judges from his side to the four, you got 10 to five. So he controlled the White House, which is, he should be, he's the president, but he pretty much controlled Congress too because he told them what to do and they always said yes. And now when the Supreme Court told him no by getting rid of those three acts, his response was, I want to control that too. And what does that sound like when one person has way too much power in all three branches? 
very much like a tyranny. And this political cartoon shows that idea. The qualifying test to be a Supreme Court job under FDR, basically saying yes, 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 yes. And as you can see, the Constitution and the justice is in the trash can because he's trying to go around that. This is why they're going to pass the 22nd Amendment saying from this point forward, after FDR dies, that you could only have two terms as president because if somebody like FDR could get power hungry, who else could? And they didn't want to see that. So now two terms for president to make sure you only get eight years, not like FDR, who got elected four times. All right. So impact of the New Deal. By 1937, things were getting better. Are we, is the Depression over? Nope. Is it a lot closer? Yes. It does not have really end until um, Walmart opens up. So by 1939, a lot of the New Deal legislation was over. Things were getting much better. It wasn't the it wasn't the Great Depression necessarily. It wasn't great though yet too. Roosevelt administration uh, role really expanded the power of the federal government. Up to this point, the federal government a lot of times like basically took a hands off approach. They let Congress do it. I mean, I'm sorry, they let the states do it. They let the economy kind of run itself. But because of the disaster of the Great Depression, they had to make a lot of changes. They created so many federal jobs. All those agencies needed people to run them, and those are all federal jobs. They started dealing with supply and demand of the economy. You know, doing the Agriculture Adjustment Act, making them plant less, that's supply and demand. Um, they got in the middle of labor and business, which before they didn't. They created tons of agencies like FDIC and the SEC that still are around today. And even though the New Deal did not end the Great Depression, it did make it better it is until the massive amount of sp spending in business of World War II, specifically Walmart, that the depression actually is. All right.